Hello, I'm Renee Brown, pastor of the Mount Zion First Baptist Church. Welcome to our live stream broadcast. Whether you're viewing by Facebook Live or YouTube, we're honored to have you here and we hope that this experience will be a powerful encounter. God bless you and I hope to see you in person real soon. Peace and honor and glory as we come into the house of the Lord, we will enter in with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. We will be thankful unto him and bless his name for the Lord is good. All of you all who are in the house, can you say yes he is? The Lord is good. Yes, the Lord is. is good. The Lord is good. Come on, open up your mouth. Begin to worship. The Lord is good and his mercy endureth forever as we approach the throne of grace uh, and mercy with our prayer. Father God, in Jesus' name, we thank you for this time of gathering. We thank you, Lord, for one more Sunday to come and give you praise and worship because, God, we thank you. There's no one like you. So, Father God, as we go into this period of praise and worship, we ask that you forgive us for anything yes, that we started or said that was not pleasing into your sight. Father, forgive us, Lord. Yes, God. Let your glory fill this place, Lord. Let us know that it's all about you, but it's yes, not God. about us, Lord Jesus. Father, have your way through these songs and let someone be uplifted, encouraged, yes, to go on and see what the end is going to be. So, Father, we say thank you. Thank we ask you, that you send your glory and send your anointing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And we count it all done in your name. Amen. Does anybody love the Lord on this morning? As we enter in, we're just going to tell the Lord how much we love him, how much we adore him, how much we appreciate him on this morning. say this I love you I love you I love you Lord today because you cared for me in such a special way that's why I praise you I lift you up and I magnify your name that's why Because you're 
my mind went back to the country where we used to sing another song that talked about how they loved the Lord and it was an old song and, and it simply said I love the Lord he heard my cry and pitied my every groan as long as I live while trouble arise, I'll hasten to his throne. I don't care what you say, God has been good to us, and we ought to give him praise. Amen. I said God has been good to us. I, I didn't say he'd been good to me. I said he's been good to us. Amen. Thank you, Sister Danielle and Brother Arthur and these wonderful musicians, I'm so grateful to have such a dedicated and committed team of worshipers. Amen. I want to read Zechari Zechariah chapter 7 in your hearing. I want you to turn with us to Zechariah. Uh, that's in the Old Testament. Uh, Zechariah. And the chapter number seven, Zechariah chapter seven, and I want to look at verse number five. Our focal verse is verse five, but we're looking at the chapter. And he says, ask all the people of the land and the priests, when you fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh months for the past 70 years, was it really for me that you fasted? I, I want to talk about lifestyle, not luxury. Lifestyle, not luxury. Brothers and sisters, there was a television show that used to come on entitled The Lifestyle of the Rich and Famous. And it took you through daily activity in the homes of people who were famous. And then there was another show that was called Cribs because black folk hadn't made it to rich and famous, so they started another show, Cribs. And you could go and see how black folk were living in their nice cribs, amen. And one of the things I have discovered, I don't care how nice your home is, I don't care how fine a car you drive, one day you gonna leave it, or it's gonna leave you. And you can have people talk about how lavish your lifestyle was. But when you come to the end of your journey, weary of life and the battle has been won, people are not going to talk about how good your lifestyle was. They're they going to talk about how you lived for Jesus. Did you hear what I said? And when we look at this passage, it's interesting, brothers and sisters, and I want you to write this down. This is this is key to the understanding of this passage. If a person would try to manipulate God, what do you think they would do to God's children? I, I want you to ride with me today. If, if a person would try to manipulate God, what do you think they would try to do to one of God's children? And when you look at this book, and in particular this seventh chapter, it's dated from 452 to 7, 475 BC, 552 to 475 BC. It spans some 45 years. And brothers and sisters, I've discovered this and I want you to write this down also. When it comes to manipulating people, there is no better instrument than the lie. If you want to manipulate people, the best tool you can use to manipulate people is a lie. And the Bible says that Satan is the father of lies. He makes his living lying. 
And whenever somebody makes their living lying, it's because they're trying to get over on somebody else who really doesn't know the truth about their life and the truth about their lifestyle. Can you say amen right there? And so brothers and sisters, when you look at the Declaration of Independence, it says we hold these truths to be self-evident. And here's the first question, self-evident to who? Because when you look at the Declaration of Independence and you look at the preamble, this is the introductory statement to the Declaration of Independence. And when you look at it and you see that it's a lie, just in the preamble, if you lie in the introductory statements, then what does that say about the body of the doctrine? The Declaration of Independence states that the principles on which our government and our identity as Americans are based. So when people read the document, it ought to look like the people in which it represents. But just like that document does not represent the people that it's supposed to represent, the Bible, in many instances, we don't represent what the Bible says we ought to represent. I, I told you I was going somewhere with this. So when you think about the lies that we've been told, you can also look at the lies that we live out in opposition to what God has said in his word. If we look at our motto, in God we trust. That's our official motto. That's the official motto of the United States of America. We put it on our money, but it is actually the money that we trust in. And we hope that God will give us some of that money. When we look at this union that we have, it's capitalistic society, capitalism, an economic system based on private ownership of the means of production and the operation for profit. When you look at capitalism, only the people who have property, only the people who are wealthy make the decisions. And the poor folk have nothing to say about the decisions being made. Amen, somebody. So when you think about this, you look at all the lies we've been told. Here's what I want you to get, brothers and sisters. Faith builds a nation, but lies will tear it down. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 34 tells us, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin condemns any people. So I asked a friend of mine a few weeks ago, I said, help me understand something. When companies, Fortune 500 companies, banks, car dealerships, lending institutions, when, when they get in trouble, the government bails them out. But what happens when people get in trouble? Have you noticed that when people get in trouble, nobody bails them out? In fact, they'll have their house repossessed and end up homeless. And so I said, help me understand something. I, I want to make sure I understand this correctly. So now, if we are in a deficit and a virus comes, then we turn around and send stimulus checks to people who pay taxes. Let, let me slow down. I, I'm going too fast. <laughs> You're in a deficit. A virus comes and then you start giving people money to keep them afloat. Where does the money come from? I already knew the answer, but, but I wanted somebody who was smarter than me, who, who understood this better than I did. So I asked him, I said, tell me where the money comes from. He said, well, well, pastor, we make the money. So when you make the money in a capitalistic society, when you need money, all you have to do is reprint it. And it's not counterfeit, it's the real deal. But when poor folk try to make money, 
They can't even get above minimum wage, and so what they wind up doing is they get on unemployment so they can take advantage of the system that's been put in place, and now you have nobody to help you and work when you need something. Because you got a system that's in place that's designed for the rich to get richer and the poor to stay poor. Amen, somebody. So I said, wait a minute now. So, so we make money. So where do you get the money from to pay back the money that you made? He said, oh, well, that's, that's simple. We just write that off. We just write that off. Oh, oh. So then, in other words, this is about the lifestyle of the rich and famous. And those who are poor don't have a poor chance. Amen, somebody. Until people, write this down, get this. Those of you listening, make sure you post this. Until people grow to the level where they trust God, they will never know the truth of their relationship. Until you grow to the level where you trust God, you will never know the truth of your real relationship. And one of the things I'm discovering in the midst of this virus, God is saying, do you trust me or do you trust America? Do you trust me or do you trust your money? Do you trust me or do you trust the folk that's in charge? This virus is teaching me how to better trust God. Because I, I, I was wondering, I was wondering in my mind, in the midst of the virus, what does a person who has no insurance do? Okay, okay, let me slow down. If you have no insurance and, and you have a minimum wage job, what then do you do? Evidently, you will have to trust God because the only way you're going to make it, you already know if you get the virus, you are going because you have no insurance to even go and be tested. Amen, somebody. And the song came to my mind that we used to sing in Kansas. I used to visit a church and preach for Pastor Leo Barbie at the Victory Bible Church and, and he had he had this country western kind of fella that led worship and, and he, he would sing this song, they would know we are Christians by our love. <laughs> and, and, and it would say we are one in the spirit. We are one in the Lord. We are one in the spirit we are one in the Lord and we pray that all unity may one day be restored and they'll know we are Christians by our love by our love yes they'll know we are Christians by our love and here is the problem we are not acting like Christians we are not living a lifestyle of a Christian. We are living a lifestyle of the rich and famous. We are living a lifestyle that's not indicative of the Bible that we read. So when you look at the background of Zechariah, brothers and sisters, it's an Old Testament prophecy whereby this prophet shares with us about the coming glory of the Messiah. And there are two major sections in this book. The first eight chapters deal with the prophet's encouragement to the people to finish the work of the rebuilding of the temple. And then from, verses, from chapter 9 through 14, he shares with them a picture of Israel's glorious future and the coming of the Messiah. He said, in essence, if you can just make it till the Messiah gets here, everything will be all right. Can I say it another way? If we can just make it till the master gets here, we'll be all right. Yes, the virus is still doing its thing, but if we can just make it till the master comes. In the first section, Zechariah introduces himself as God's prophet, and he calls the people 
to repent and to turn from their evil ways. He calls them to repent and, re and turn from their evil ways. He calls them to repent and turn from their evil ways. You will notice we haven't repented not once in six months. And neither have we changed from our evil ways. In fact, we are more evil now than we were six months ago. We're more mean now than we were six months ago. We're more hateful now than we were six months ago. Nothing has changed. It's gotten worse. And part of the sin, brothers and sisters, was their failure to finish the work of rebuilding the temple after they had returned from captivity. Let me say it another way. After God let them loose, when God let them get out of captivity, they quit building on the temple. When they got out of the virus, they went back to doing what they were doing. I'm trying to make it where it's updated. Brothers and sisters, he gives a series of visions, eight visions that he has. But he shares with them how important it is to finish what you started. And brothers and sisters, even Jesus, when he came on the scene, he, he was quoted for saying, Father, I have finished the work you've assigned to my hand. The worst thing a, a child of God can do is not finish what God has assigned for him or her to do. He called you. He gifted you. But you're not doing what he called you and gifted you to do. And then when you get on your sick bed, then you want to ask him, Lord, let me have one more chance. Lord, get me up off the bed. I promise I'll do right. And then you get up off your bed and you go right back to doing what you were doing. Because here's what I've discovered. We are not telling the truth about who we are supposed to be. Look at verse 4. I want to show it to you in your Bible. I don't want you to think I'm making it up. It's in the Bible. He says, then the word of the Lord Almighty came to me. That's the truth. See, whenever the word comes, that's the truth. Anything else is a lie. When the word of God came to Zechariah, Zechariah said to the people, we need to do something different. And so the truth of the word is in verse 4. And it's interesting because 13 times in the book of Zechariah, 13 times in the book of Zechariah, he says the word of the Lord came. When you look at Zechariah chapter 1 verse 1, he says in the word, he said in that text, in the eighth month of the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to the prophet. Zechariah chapter 1 verse 7, he says the same thing. In Zechariah chapter 4 verse 6, he says the same thing. Zechariah chapter 4 verse 8 he says again the word of the Lord came to me chapter 6 verse 9 he said the word of the Lord came to me but then three times three times three times in the chapter that we're studying he says the word of the Lord came to me the first time it came to me it specified a time the second time it came to me it specified a test he said let me ask them something and the third time it came, he said it was the truth about what was important to God. And I've discovered this, brothers and sisters, what's important to God ought to be important to us. But in truth and reality, it's not. And so as a result, Zechariah says, the word of the Lord came to me three times in chapter 7. But then it came in chapter 8, verse 1, chapter 8, verse 18, chapter 9, verse 1, chapter 11, verse 11, chapter 12, verse 1. Thirteen times it came to him. Why are you saying this, Pastor? Because evidently, Zechariah couldn't do anything till he heard from God. And whenever leadership is not listening to God, that's not leadership you need to trust. If the leadership is not listening to God, then you don't need to trust that leadership. I didn't say don't listen to him. I said don't trust it. Because if the leader does not trust what God is saying, then you can't trust what the leader is saying. Oh, y'all missed what I just said. I, I said something right there. And it's interesting to me, brothers and, took, brothers and sisters, it took some courageous preaching during that season. He had to preach to people who did not want to hear what God had to say because they had been in captivity. And I've discovered whenever folk are in captivity, the last thing they want to hear is God. Amen, Amen somebody. And this is a return for the people. This is a call for the return of the people to get back to God. And I believe God is saying to us today, we need to get back to God. 
Why, Pastor? Because God may not change your circumstance, but he will change you in the midst of the circumstance. God may not do anything with the virus, but he'll change you in the midst of the virus. God may not do anything with your finances, but God will do something to you in the midst of your financial problem. So I looked at the passage, and he's sharing this to a whole nation. So if we could just kind of update the story, he's sharing this with the United States of America. And God says, you can perform, you can placate, you can play church, you can even go and make a photo op in front of a church and hold up a Bible upside down if you want to. He said, you can go through the motions, you can practice church, you can produce anything you want as a result of being in church, you can present yourself to church, you can make a spectacle at church, you can perform in church, you can even put yourself on public display, but he said, that's not going to impress me. God says, I don't care how much you go to church, I'm not impressed. God said, I don't care what you do when you go to church. I'm not impressed. He said, I don't care if you got perfect attendance in church. I'm not impressed. Because if your lifestyle does not line up with what I have said in my word, you're just going through the motions. You're not telling the truth about who I am. And brothers and sisters, I could not help but see this. There's a problem in this text that I need to point out, and I hate to have to do it, but because I'm a prophet of God, I got to do it. So don't get angry, don't get upset, don't post it on Facebook and send it to me because talk to God about it. There's a problem in this text and it's obvious to me that it's the same problem that America has. It's the problem of idolatry. What is idolatry, Pastor? I'm glad you asked. It's the replacing of God in the mindset of people. You see, it used to be about replacing God with images. That was the whole issue with the calf, with Moses and the Israelites. But now, it's not so much making of idols, but it's replacing what you think about the most. And that which you think about the most is the most important to you. Don't, let me do it this way, I used to say this often. Check your checkbook. Wherever you write out the majority of your checks, that's your idol. And I know most of you no longer use checks. So check your E statement. And the majority of where you spend your money on your E statement, that's your idol. Did you hear what I just said? If, if more money goes to your house than it does God's house, it tells you which house is more important. If more money goes on your children than it goes for God's children, that tells you where your idol is. Am I making sense? Brothers and sisters, whenever something gets between you and God, that thing becomes your idol. And he's sharing this to the whole nation. And he says to them, I don't like what you're doing. And this is what God does to get them out of the rut of idolatry. The best thing you can do, the best way to keep people from idolatry is put them in captivity. Amen. Let me say it again. Amen. The best way to control people and keep them from idolatry Amen. is put them in captivity. Amen. Because when you put them in captivity, then their captivity oppresses them in such a way that they can't think about God, they can only think about who has captured them. And so what happens to people is if I can get you in enough debt, you are more concerned about the debt than you do about God. If I can keep you in a situation where you're more concerned about what the man does to you than what God is doing for you, I got you in captivity. Because what the enemy has learned, brothers and sisters, based on 2 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 5, if you can just mess with a person's mind, 
You got it. Watch this. Let me show this to you. I won't read it to you. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Turn in your Bibles to this. I want you to see this because it's in your Bible if you didn't tear it out. And most folk don't want to know about this. Amen, somebody. Watch this. Chapter 10, verse 5. We demolish arguments and every pretentious every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ watch what he says Paul says you got to make sure that nothing captures your mind because whatever captures your mind captures your activity whatever your mind focuses on then it has you captured it, it messes with your attention span. Let me see if I can't do it another way. When, when, when a black child, when a black child has a problem paying attention in school, they put the child on Ritalin. And the purpose of the Ritalin is to slow the child's mind down so the child can pay attention. But, but now watch what happens. So now, if the child's mind has been slowed down and it pays attention, do you think it can pay attention and grasp as fast as it would if its mind has been numbed? Let, let me say it a different way because y'all looking at me kind of strange. Before they had Ritalin, where I came from, they had a paddle. Amen. They had a paddle. And when you couldn't pay attention, they sent you to somebody who could get your attention. They called him the principal. And when the principal got through getting your attention, you went back to class and you sat your behind down like you had some sense because you knew that there was somebody that knew how to get your attention. All I'm trying to say is this. God knows when something has your attention and he'll send you into the hands of the devil so that the devil can make you recognize he can whip you, but God can save you if you trust him. I, I had a horse. I have a horse that really, she really, she's really good. She's the best, she's the best horse I've ever had. She's really, 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 really good. She's really, really good, Brother Willie, but she, she was hyper. She, she just, just liked to go fast. And, and so the trainer said, he said, well, we, what we gonna do, we gonna, we gonna, we gonna give her some ace to slow her down. And so I said, okay, well, let's give her some ace to slow her down. So we give her the shot, and then instead of her being all hyper, she walks in. And all that prettiness and all that ability that she has, you can't see it because she's been doped up. So after we did that, I said, look, I, I don't want to own, I don't want to own Ace. I said, what I'm going to do, I, I'm just going to start riding her about two hours before I have to show her. And I'm going to just get her tired and I'm going to just keep working on her until I get her tired so that when she get in the arena, she going to act the way I know she know how to act. Did y'all hear what I just said? Let me say it a different way because you, you didn't get it because you got caught up in the horse analogy. Here, listen. I've discovered this about God. God said when you don't know how to act, he'll just make you run around behind stuff and chase stuff till you get tired of chasing and tired of running around and you figure out, wait a minute, the God's way is the best way. I better act like I got some sense. Y'all didn't hear what I just said. God is trying to tell us we are not acting like we are supposed to be acting. When I was in class in seminary, my professor, Dr. Olson, in our counseling class, Dr. Olson said something that, that baffled me. He said, he said a couple of things. He said, but one in particular, he said this. He said, when people come to you for counseling, the, the, the issue that they present generally is not the issue that's really the problem. Did you hear me? The, the issue that they present, that's not really what's going on. They, they throw out a whole lot of other issues, but you're going to have to peel away all the other issues until you figure out what the real issue is. Am I making sense? But then he also said, what they'll do, brothers and sisters, he said, they'll try to manipulate you and try to get you to be on their side and understand what's wrong with them because they've already self-diagnosed themselves. 
They've been self-diagnosed. They've already said, well, this is what's wrong with me. Because see, somebody else has told me this. And so because somebody else told me that, they just assume that's what's wrong with them. And, and so they just accept the fact that somebody else has told them that they're crazy. And so because somebody told them that they're crazy, they just assume that they're crazy. Not realizing that there's something else going on and you might not be crazy. You might just need to talk to somebody and let go some of the stuff you're holding on to. And so I said, well, okay, well, that's a good idea. I like what he said. Because he said this, look, brothers and sisters, the issue is not race. Did you hear what I said? The issue that we're dealing with is not race. Hmm. Race is obvious, but it's not the root. And until you deal with the root, the fruit will always be bad. Because when you look at the New Testament, idolatry is an intellectual concept. And what's really going on in America is idolatry. It's not racism, it's not sexism, it's really idolatry. Right with me right through here, you'll see what I'm talking about when I get through it. If you look at Colossians chapter 3 verse 5, it says, put to death. Therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, greed, which is idolatry. Okay, that's not good enough. Look at Ephesians chapter 5 verse 5. For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a man is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Anybody that's immoral can't even get in the kingdom. They can get in the White House, but they can't get in the kingdom. And so as a result, they had some good kings in the southern kingdom of Judah, but they also had some bad ones. And the bad ones invariably fell to idolatry. Just like you're going to have some good black people, some white bad, some good white people, some good red people, some good yellow people, you're also going to have some bad ones. And for some reason, just like you have some good cops, you're going to have some bad ones. And for some reason, the bad always outweigh the good. Amen, somebody. This prompted these prophets to talk about it because they saw what was going on. In essence, it's a leadership issue. And whenever your leadership promotes his or herself over and against the cause, you will have problems. That brings me to the next point. Not just truth, but test. Look at verse 5. He says, ask all the people of the land and the priests, not just the people, but the priests, which suggests that the priest was involved in his foolishness right along with the people. Instead of the priests doing what they're supposed to be doing, they following the leadership of the people. Amen, somebody. And he says, when you fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh months for the past 70 years, was it really for me that you fasted? Now this, this messed me up right here. How you gonna fast and pray for 70 years and it not be real? Okay, let me slow down. How you gonna fast and pray for 70 years and it's not real? The same way you can play church for 70 years and it not be real. The same way you can show up for 70 years in a church and it not be real. Mm. Look at verse 4. Then the word. And then look at verse 8. Then the word came again. Wait a minute. Verse 4. Then the word. Then verse 8, then the word came again, and the word came again. Sandwiched right between verse 4 and verse 8 is the test. Here's the problem. In between verse 4 and verse 8, like a big piece of salami. When I was a boy, my mother, we used to go to St. Joseph, and we had some cousins that owned a store Cousin Leon and Cousin B. Brown. And we would get, my mama would get thick slices of lunch meat. Thick slices of bologna. 
thick slices of salami. Not that stuff you get in the store where you got to stack six or seven pieces to have some meat in the midst of the bread. And, and, and we used to get those big pieces of meat. I'm, I'm talking about big pieces of meat. And, and you had to slow cook them. You couldn't cook them fast. But when you bite down in it, you had more meat than you did bread. And brothers and sisters, when I looked at the test, when I looked at this text, I, I noticed, you see, sometimes we don't pay enough attention to the meat because we are more attracted to the bread. Amen. Especially if you're a bread person like me. Amen. And so I looked at, I thought about it. You see, whenever God starts to question you, it's not going to end up well. God asked the question, was it really me that you fasted for? So you trying to fool me? Look at verse 6. He says, you feasting for yourself. <laughs> you got that great big sandwich. That's what we call them where I came from, a sandwich. You got that great big sandwich because <laughs> you like eating. He said, you're not doing this for me. You're doing this for yourself. You like the way it tastes. You like the way you feel when you live large and in charge. You like it when you are living the lifestyle of the rich. You like that. And he says, that's not interesting to me. He said, you need to check your motives. It's right here in this text. Their motives were selfish. Their motives were insincere. Insincere. He said, there needs to be some repentance. There needs to be some humility. That's more important than fasting. What good is it to fast and you're not humble? What good is it to fast and you won't repent or change from your ways? They are focused on their problem, but they are pleading with God to help them. That's what's happening in America. We are focused on the virus and asking God to help us, but we won't do what God is telling us to do. Let me see if I can't make it plain. <laughs> they say we need a social distance. They say we cannot gather in large groups. They say we have to wear masks. And guess what? We don't want to do it. And you wonder why things are not getting better? Because you don't want to do what you're supposed to do. Let me say it another way. When I was a student at Southern University, I used to have to go to chemistry class. And, and I love to go to the lab. Brother Celestine, I love to go to chemistry lab. I love to go to chemistry lab. I, I go to chem, I, boy, I love to go to chemistry lab. Man, you get to mixing up chemicals and doing stuff and making stuff happen and dissecting stuff in, in biology. You know, I love to go to lab. But I, I didn't care for lecture. So I got this bright idea. Got this bright idea. Brother Hughes, I said, well, you know what? I'm going to go to lab and I'm not going to the lecture. There's a whole lot of people in the lecture. There's hundreds of people in the lecture. So I can hide out. They won't know if I'm in there or not. Ain't no big thing. They don't keep rolling in the lecture. They keep rolling in the lab. They don't keep rolling in the lecture. They, they don't care if you come to the, to the lecture. They're not concerned about it. So I'm not going to lecture. I'm just going to go to lab. And the test came. The test had nothing to do with what we did in lab. It had everything to do with what we did in lecture. And so I looked at the paper, and the paper looked at me. I looked at the paper, the paper looked at me. I put my name on the paper, turned the paper in, and said, God bless you, Dr. Chris. I went on about my business because I couldn't answer a single thing on the paper because I hadn't been to lecture. Y'all missed what I just said. You didn't get what I just said. Brothers and sisters, that's how it is with God. See, a whole lot of us spend time in the lab, but we never want to spend time in the lecture. We never want to come to church and hear what the preacher has to say. And you're going to get your grade not based on what happens outside. It's based on what happens inside. And I would suggest we need to start going to the lecture. Amen, somebody. Brothers and sisters, God is not taking attendance in church. He finds out what you know when you get to the lab. He knows when you come up against certain stuff in the lab that you haven't been to lecture. And because of that, instead of spewing out the word of God, you spewing out curse words. That's because you've been in the lab and not in the practice of the lecture. 
Amen, somebody. Because we can't assemble in the building doesn't mean that we can't do ministry. I'm amazed at how many people won't even come to church online. Amen, somebody. I'm amazed at people who won't even call the church and see how the church is doing. Some folk we haven't seen in seven months. Some of them don't even know if the church is still standing. Amen, somebody. I'm amazed at people who won't send their tithes to the church in the midst of the virus. We'll do a drive-by birthday party, but we won't even drive by the church to make sure it's still sitting there. Oh, Lord, have mercy. They fasted for 70 years while they were in exile. They are mourning for the loss of the temple. You and I, we are in exile, but God is still with us. You aren't coming to the house, but you can still get to God. The church isn't lost. You still have a God. You still can find him. This should be a time of learning, not a time off. This should be lecture season. Amen. This should be a season, brothers and sisters, where you recognize that God is working on you, trying to do something in you that he had not been doing. Learn to fast when you have to make tough decisions because that helps you understand what your purpose is. Learn to fast to set aside physical pleasure because when you can set aside physical pleasure, God can get your attention. And here's what's getting me, brothers and sisters. You can stop doing something when you fast. You can stop doing something so that you can start doing something else. You can stop that to start this. Set a time, set a place, and pick an object. And then fast from that object. Why? So that you can feast on God's word. Worship and prayer meet when you go into fasting. Explain to me, if you're not coming to Sunday school at 8.30, not coming to church at 9.30, not coming to Bible study at 12.15 or 6.15 on Wednesday, let me ask you a question, what are you doing? <laughs> I'm trying to figure out, if, if you're not coming here, what are you doing? Because in the midst of this pandemic, what should happen, you should be spending more time in the lecture trying to get some insight for what God is doing in your life so that when you come out of this thing, you will know how to act. Let me say it another way. When you get out of captivity, when you can now leave your house, you will know how to act now because you spent time in the lecture. Brothers and sisters, all of this for 70 years, and they weren't real in their relationship. Amen. Can I ask you a question? What have you replaced right. your presence in church with? Amen. Since you're not coming here at 9.30, where are you at 9.30? Since you're not here at 8.30, where are you? Amen. Since you're not here on Wednesday, where are you? I'm just, I'm, you don't have to answer me, I'm just asking. Amen. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not God, I'm just asking questions. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, Two years after the visions, they are halfway through rebuilding the temple. Yes, All this is for them. It's just like another annual day. Amen. I was so glad when I came to this church as pastor and they didn't have annual days, I, I could have kissed the leadership. Yes, annual days are nothing but fundraisers. And when you do those annual days, let me tell you something. Basically what you're saying is, we got a better way than what God has. And God said, I told you what my way is, tithes and offering. You don't need no pew rally. You don't need to wash cars. You don't need to sell no chicken plates. If you want to do that, you go ahead. Because what you're saying is, I got a better way than what God has. Amen, lights. I made somebody mad now. They just turned off Facebook. Their real love was money. You see, we don't care anything about God or the church. We care about money. That's when you read 1 Timothy 6, 10 says this, for the love of money is the root of all evil. 
But in case you can't get that, the OJ said, money, 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 money. Some people, they got to have it. Some people really need it. You wonder what's wrong with society, what's this nation? It's money. But you don't believe me. Look at Haggai chapter 1 verse 4. It's a time for you yourselves to be living in your panel houses while this house remains in ruin. The prophet Nathan comes to David and David says, how can I live in this good looking luxurious house and God's house is going to ruin? It's something wrong when, when your house looks better than God's house. I shouldn't have said that, huh? Something wrong when the furniture in your house is better than the furniture in God's house. When you bring the furniture that you're taking out of your house to God's house. Something's wrong with that. Because God is not important. And his church surely is not important. But let me give you one more. 2 Samuel chapter 7 verse 2. He said... Then the prophet Nathan, here I am living in a palace of cedar while the ark of God remains in a tent. He said, I'm, I'm living large, living in luxury, and the presence of God is in a tent. He said, there's something wrong with that. So that brings us to this last issue, trust. Not just the truth, not just testing, but look at trust. Verse 9, this is what the Lord says. Administer true justice show mercy and compassion to one another this is an example of what they think is important versus what God thinks is important God is concerned about attitude and motivation we are concerned about form and fashion to this old unfriendly world for an outside show worship is not an occasional activity but it's a living that's a way of living we worry about what day we're going to worship, what time the worship is going to be, what activities are we going to have when we get there, what order of service are we going to go by, what's going to be the musical choices, what's going to be the sermon length. I'll never forget, never forget the first Sunday I came to the church, the first Sunday I came to the church, one of the good deacons met me at the back, I won't say who it is, one of the good deacons met me at the back and told me on my way in, he said, but pastor, uh, we get out at 12 o'clock. I said, okay. He said, Pastor, we get out at 12 o'clock. I said, 12 o'clock. I said, okay, we start at 11, we get out at 12. He said, yes, sir, start at 11, get out at 12. I said, well, well why is that? He said, well, because the broadcast goes off at 12. I said, oh, so the broadcast gets off at 12, goes off at 12, and so you associate with getting out with when the broadcast go, on, go off. So at 12 o'clock, I was on point number one. You catch that one on your way home. I said, now, if I'm going to sit here and watch y'all go through all that stuff y'all doing for an hour, I'm going to at least take an hour to preach about what God has given me to preach about. Y'all miss what I just said. So you can spend all that time doing the preliminaries you want to, but I'm going to take as much time as I need because I've discovered folk want to hear the singing, but they won't hear the preaching. Singing doesn't make you live better. It may make you jump and run, but it ain't going to make you live better. Amen, somebody. He says in this word, you got to be careful what you're doing. Why is it now we can have service in an hour, but prior to COVID-19, it was two and a half hours? Why is it we can have a graveside service now, but we had to bring mama through the church before COVID-19? Why is it? We had to have a repass. Now you don't have to have a repass. Why all of a sudden now it's okay to cremate, but before COVID, you weren't being cremated. No, I got to be put in the body, my body got to be put in the ground. It's amazing what the virus has done and how it's changed some of the traditions that the pastor would have got put out for trying to do. I got to close here. I'm past my hour already. The Bible says this, four commands that shape the worship. Four things in this text. Read them when you get home. Check them out when you get home. This is what it says. Administer true worship. Administer true worship. That, that, that's, that's important. Administer true worship. But then watch what he says. Matter of fact, let me just read it. Verse number nine. This is what the Lord Almighty says. 
administer true justice, show mercy and compassion to one another. Do not oppress the widow or the fatherless, the alien or the poor. In your hearts, do not think evil of each other. Do you see what he said? He said, look, this is what I expect of you. This is what I want you to do. This is what is important to me. I need you to change your lifestyle. I need you to be able to administer true worship. Show people what it means to be a part of true worship. I want you to show people real mercy and real compassion. Brothers and sisters, it's not about doing what's easy or the thing that makes you comfortable or happy. It's about doing what's right. In the Gospels, there is virtually nothing about idolatry. But in the letters of Paul and the other New Testament books, Christians frequently were warned against idolatry. The Christians lived in a way and in a world that was filled with idolatry and idols. And Paul tried to address that even in Acts chapter 17. But brothers and sisters, there are no, I mean there are, these are rather my requirements, God says. And without these requirements, there will be no restoration. And there will be no rejoicing. I require that you administer true worship, that you show mercy and compassion, that you do not oppress people, and that you do not think that you are more than what you are. Are y'all listening to me? Brothers and sisters, we are lifting up flags, statues, police, people, and even race. We're marching, protesting, looting, rioting, voting, etc. But what about doing what God has said. What should I have expected? What should I be doing? Let me do what God has said. He says mercy, which is a genuine relationship with one another. You see, when you have mercy for people, you don't feel sorry for them, you have a general relationship with them. And because of that relationship, that genuine relationship, you do right by them because you see them as you see yourself faithfulness mercy love and loyalty but then he say compassion compassion is that word that you have for a mother like a mother and an unborn child how mother bonds with that child when it's in her womb even before the child comes out that's real compassion you mad about abortion and you fighting for abortion and you all not have an abortion well I agree but I can tell you something else I discovered What's the difference between fighting to keep people from having an abortion and fighting for a man who has his three children in the back of a car and you shoot him seven times in the back? Death is death. Whether it's a baby or it's a grown man with three children in the back of a car. I don't understand why we don't understand that. Are y'all listening? It's because we don't have compassion. When you look at verse 11 and 14, I'm getting out of here, Brother Chris. I'm going to leave right here. He says, but they refused to pay attention. Stubbornly, they turned their backs and stopped up their ears. They made their hearts as hard as flints and would not listen to the law or to the words that the Lord Almighty had sent by his spirit through the earlier prophets. So the Lord Almighty was very angry. When I called, they did not listen. So when they called, I would not listen, says the Lord Almighty. I scattered them with a whirlwind among all the nations where they were strangers. The land was left so desolate behind them that no one could come or go. This is how they made the pleasant land desolate. Isn't that like us? God said, I fixed it where you can't come or go. I fixed it where you can't do what you want to do. I fixed it where you got to stay locked up in your house. I fixed it where you can't get up in each other's face. You can't shake hands. You can't hug. You can't do a holy kiss. He said, I fixed it where you got to be separated from each other. You know why? Because you won't listen to me. And because you won't listen to me, guess what? I'm not listening to you. And you trying to figure out what God is up to? God said, I'm waiting on my children to start listening to me and do what I say they ought to do. I'm done. It's a lifestyle. And I gave up on the lifestyle of the rich and famous. I, I don't need that lifestyle. I need a lifestyle of a Christian. I need the kind of lifestyle that helps me when I don't know what I'm going to do. And in case you don't know what I mean, brothers and sisters, I'm going to say it to you in the words of a song. There are some things I may not know. There are some places 
I may not be able to go. But one thing I know that God is real for I can feel his love within. God is real. In the midst of a pandemic, he's real. In the midst of everything that's going on with rioting and protest, God is still real. And I'd rather live the lifestyle of a child of God than the lifestyle of the rich and famous because I serve a God who not only woke me up this morning, but a God that keeps me going in the midst of the day. And I'm simply saying, brothers and sisters, don't let this stuff get to you. You're just finding out how crazy we are as people. Black folk, white folk, red folk, all of us crazy. And when I say crazy, I'm talking about we're not crazy about God. We're crazy about idols. And that stuff is what's causing all the problems. I'm done. God bless you today. I'm 15 minutes past my time. But you know what? It'll be all right. Because here's what I've discovered, brothers and sisters. In all that you do, even if you have to do it for 70 years, you better make sure it's real. Because if it's not real, if your love for God is not real, it's going to show up. It's going to show up when trouble comes. It's going to show up in the midst of a virus. It's going to show up in the midst of death. If your relationship with God is not real, it's going to show up whenever pressure comes into your life. The only reason problems come because God wants to know, have you been in the lecture or are you just hanging out in the lab? The test is not based on what's in the lab. It's based on what's happening in the lecture. The lecture prepares you for when you go out there in the lab. And if I hadn't spent time in the lecture, I'd hurt somebody in the lab. Y'all didn't hear what I just said. My wife and I were talking about this the other day, talking about the right to bear arms. And, and I don't own a pistol to this day. Because my daddy told me, he said, son, don't pull a gun on a person unless you're going to use it. And the Lord's still working on me, and so I don't own a pistol. Because I don't want to find out how much work he still has to do. Amen, somebody. You better learn how to trust God. This invitation is for you. This invitation is for you. You listening? Perhaps you're ready to throw in the towel. Perhaps you're ready to give up. You've been talking to God, but God isn't listening to you. It's not that he's not listening to you. He's not listening to America. Because America is not listening to him. If you're not saved, you're not active in anybody's church, this invitation is for you. Call 225-383-5401. We'll accept you as a member through our discipleship ministry. Why don't you call? Why don't you make that decision? It's up to you. Saying, Sister Danielle.
Father, we do thank you for this day. We especially thank you for your word. Now that we have been in the lecture, we're going to have to go out into the lab now. Not in the lab of the lifestyle of the rich and famous, but the lifestyle of a child of God. Because we understand it's not in the abundance of the things that we have, it's in the fact that we have you. So regardless of our house, car, whatever, because of you and our relationship with you, we want to tell the truth about who you are. So that when people see us, they will know that we are Christians. Not black, not white, not red, not yellow but Christians by our love. Help us to love. In the name of Jesus, may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ ready it rest, rule, and abide, and be with us all. Henceforth, now, and forevermore. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week.